This is Catherine Galden, and we're doing a Facebook video feed, and I'm with Gracie Wagner and Kathy Downs, who are experts in the monarch butterfly, and they're going to talk about the monarch larval monitoring program. We're out here in Kerr Wildlife Management Area, and they've just finished putting some flags out. So would you like to talk about the program and how master naturalists in the Hill Country can become involved? Sure. So, um, this is our site that we monitor here at the Kerr. We come out once a week to this site. I have teens who come out, uh, so you don't have to come every week, which is nice, although you can because it's absolutely gorgeous out here, as you can see, and it's a wonderful place to isolate, to come out, get some fresh air, be free to play. And it's a beautiful drive. The drive is fantastic out here also. You get to cross the river multiple times and there's fields of longhorns and you see the deer and the antelopes and, and turkeys. So yes, it's a wonderful drive to get out here also. So what we do is we come out and we check for milkweed plants. And what we've been doing this morning is uh, we're replacing flags. So our milkweeds are emerging from last year. Last year's flag was a pink flag. And so when we find the milkweed has re-emerged this year, we're replacing the pink flag with this year's orange flag. So that's, and then that's how we find them. We have to have the flags out here because of the grass. It gets really tall. And if we don't have the flags, we just can't find the milkweeds. And once we find the milkweed, we start looking and we start checking and um, we look for eggs and caterpillars. And this morning we have actually found four eggs. Yay. So, and we have seen an adult monarch fly through our area. So, yay, they're here. It's happening. It's working. Uh, and it's, this is exciting. This is the exciting time of year when you get to find these things and see all these in, amazing little critters and how they survive is amazing. It's, 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 you, you just can't figure out how they can survive and do this, but they do. So, um, what we will do is we have data sheets, which we fill out with all of the information on our plants, the type of plants, when we find eggs, if we find caterpillars, all of that information goes on the data sheets. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very important that the data sheets are filled out correctly because if they're not, I get a phone call from Karen Oberhauser, <laughs> which is like getting called to the principal's office. You don't want that phone call. She's a very lovely lady, but you know. So in order to, for everyone to know how to do this properly, we will be having our training this year. We moved it from February. It's going to be May the 22nd. It will be out here at the Kerr at the Bass Center, which is a wonderful building, plenty of room. Kathy will be doing our training for us like she does every single year. And hopefully we'll have Craig Hensley if he's allowed to come out and play at that point in time. But that's one of the reasons we moved it to May instead of February. So we could have our people in person. So come and do the monitor, uh, come and do the training. Once you do the training, you can monitor here or at any of the other sites that our chapter monitors. I think there's at least five, or you can monitor on your own property, which Catherine tells me she has just signed <laughs> her property up to monitor at her house. Yep. So that's another site that will be monitoring, which is important data. It's all, all the data that we send in is very important. That's why these have to be correct. So where does the data go and how does it benefit the monarch population? Well, the data is going to go directly to the uh, Monarch Larval Monitoring Project, which is now out of Wisconsin Arboretum. So the purpose of the monitoring, uh, and it's a wonderful citizen science program. It gets your community involved, it gets your neighbors and your kids involved. Kids are great for monitoring, they're closer to the ground. 
uh, they have smaller hands and better eyes than most of us do. So it's great to bring your kids along. That data is going to go directly into a database that you'd be able to uh, access from your own computer to see what kind of progress you have. And then the uh, data through all of the country's uh, input is put in together. And we're looking for trends from the monarchs. Are they late this year? Are they early this year? Are we seeing an overabundance of eggs? Are we seeing not enough eggs to sustain the population? We know we had a drop in population this year, again, very sad. Uh, so monitoring is gonna be more important than ever this year. Uh, to be able to find out why exactly we're still not seeing the habitat necessary for these uh, monarchs to be able to produce enough to increase their population. So the uh, Wisconsin Arboretum takes in all of this information from sites all over the country, collects it toward the end of the year, and then we'll usually produce a report at the end of the year that gives us a good snapshot, if you will, of what is the state of the monarchs in the continental U.S. for 2021. Can you talk about a little about the monarch life cycle and what amazing in, uh, creatures they are? Sure. Um, the monarchs generally, most people know that they are a, a migratory insect. Now that's very unusual in itself that an insect would migrate much less to that degree. Um, the population of the monarchs is dependent upon habitat available. So in the spring, we're looking for milkweed while they're breeding and laying eggs. In the fall, we're looking for nectar while they're trying to gain weight to go down. I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what kind of milkweed are you looking for out here? Well, Texas actually has 78 different kinds of milkweed. And we have about four of those present here, four or five. Uh, Gracie, what are the milkweeds you're finding now? Uh, right now, we're finding the antelope horn, which is re-emerging, and we have had a Yerbidaza zotes. Um, we have not yet seen the pearl come up. We also last year found a wavy leaf milkweed out here. Very rare. Which is, we haven't, it's not up yet. We're hoping, you know, it's just a little late because of the cold. Um, and then we have found the Veritas out here. So we have five different milkweeds mm -hmm. that uh, we get to come and look and, and it's something to come and learn also. You get to learn what they look like, how to identify them, and then you can go home and see if you have them at, on your property, which is another fun thing to do. So how many teams are working out here per year? I have four teams. Um, there is usually four to five people per team because not everybody can come every time they're scheduled to come people go on vacation or they have a doctor's appointment so um, usually there's two or three people who come out at a time other than w in may we have to do our milkweed min uh, density count which is we have to cover every single 110,000 square feet of our area and make count every single milkweed that we find and our density count. That's just a once a year count. Okay. Um, no one comes out here alone because there's no cell phone service, there's rocks, there's things that you can trip on. So we do not let anybody come alone. So it's always, you'll be with somebody, you'll never come out here by yourself. Well, in, in summary, talk just a little bit about the importance of this program and what you've gotten out of it personally by studying the monarch butterfly for what? How many years have you been That's studying the monarch? 14, now, I 14 years. 14 How years. many children have you taught about the monarch? Over 65,000. I stopped counting about 65,000 children. So um, we did a lot of school programs. The monarch life cycle is such an incredibly accurate learning tool for children. So I know that Gracie likes to say that uh, old quote that you put on your text, it's as important for, a, it's just as important for the, let's see, teaching a child not to step on the caterpillar is just as important for the child as it is the caterpillar. Okay, okay. so with that in mind, um, I was doing school labs uh, mm -hmm. with uh, many schools across the state of Texas and we would examine specimens. We go over the life cycle. The butterfly life cycle is the same pretty much for all butterflies. Um, you'll have an egg laid. 
Monarchs are generally only laying one egg per leaf and then moving on to the next milkweed when milkweed's readily available. A year like this, where we're barely emerging, uh, seeing our milkweed barely emerging now, what could happen is something called the egg loading. Uh, it would be a very unusual in, uh, circumstance for them under uh, duress, where they may lay as many as 15 or 20 eggs on an emerging antelope bone this long if availability is small and they're stressed to breed. So you have to figure that these monarchs now that are laying eggs are nine months old. They've wintered over, they've traveled to Mexico, wintered over there, survived the winter, uh, came down, got their water to uh, transfer their lymphs into uh, higher sugars for energy. They've started their move uh, breeding, and now the females are coming through and wanting to find as much milk weight as possible at this time. So monitoring is going to tell us several things, this year especially, it's going to tell us, did the mo uh, milkweed come late because of the freeze? Did the monarchs come late because the milkweed was late? I mean, these are the types of questions that we're trying to answer. Um, what kind of pattern are the monarchs showing? Are they coming straight up through the funnel of Texas the way that they would normally would? Or were they having to veer west for uh, weather conditions and so forth? So this is also giving us a great uh, snapshot of where the population is now. You can check on journeynorth.org. Uh, they have a real-time map that's animated that will show exactly where people are spotting butterflies. I kind of use it uh, to tell me when I should really start monitoring because if they're coming into South Texas already and heading up this way, then you're going to want to be looking out there um, and begin your monitoring process as soon as possible. Okay, great. Well, if I may, I'd like to follow you around a little bit, and if you have more work to do, and you can explain Certainly. as you go along what you're what you're doing. Certainly, we'd love to show you around our area. Okay, wonderful. You want to take a look and see what some of the new shoots look like, so that uh -huh. people would be able to recognize. Uh huh. Uh, milkweeds from last year so we've kind of gone through here just checking visually to see if it's re-emerged uh -huh. which it has not and so some of these uh, little cells are down are going to show where it's very kind of compact tips when they first start to come through looks similar to like a paintbrush on an artist's paintbrush uh -huh. um, I'll show you a couple of new re-emerged milkweeds here this is the uh, purple milkweed vine and this will be a secondary source for monarchs uh, if milkweed is not available they'll use this it has a very low level of the toxic ingredients that monarchs try to ingest to give them their defense mechanisms. And what is this called? This is the purple milkweed vine the common name it's a matalea m-a-t-a-l-e-a -A -E -A. and there are several of these plateau milkweed and purple milkweed vine. Uh -huh. So these are alternates to the uh, antelope horn. Here's the monitoring area. We go from down in that area all the way up this road on both sides. How many acres are we monitoring here? Okay. Something like two acres. Let me see if I can find a new emergency for you. Uh, this is probably out about a week now. You can see the leaves can start out a little bit differently and rounded, but what we're looking for in the antelope horn are these long lancelet type of leaves. Generally, they're going to curl in like this on the sides, which makes it pretty easily recognizable. And they come out of a, and they are perennial, so they're coming back every year, and they kind of come out of a long, very high content, water content uh, stem. Now, if you break and you're not sure whether this is a milkweed or a mealy blue sage, one good way to tell is to take a little piece from the leaf 
and you're going to see just a tad of white milk in the vein there. Can you see it on the camera? See it. Okay. So that's going to tell you that, yes, this is a milkweed, um, and you've identified it correctly. Okay? And then when you're monitoring, very carefully picking up, looking under the leaves, which would be the first place that the monarch wants to lay its eggs. And this they do because uh, it helps keep the temperature of the egg down for the caterpillar in the migration. So, so basically this is what we're looking for. This is not uh, typical in a year that it would start coming to bloom so soon. But where uh, antelope horn was forced after a freeze, they may just put out about an eight-inch stem and then go right to seed. Can you show the bloom where the bloom sure. is going to come? It's going to be covered by these petals, and you can see the collection inside there. Okay, and that's going to eventually uh, probably form into a pod. Mm -hmm. But the uh, bloom itself is going to be almost a perfect sphere with many, many, many flowers on the sphere. This antelope horn has an egg, and Gracie's going to show where the egg I is. Find it again. We have to get down on our hands and knees. There right there. There it is. Right there. Let's see if I can. Yeah. And describe the egg. Well, That's the egg nice, is huh? is going to be um, kind of an oval shape. It's going to be a uh, creamy color, iridescent. If you look at it with a magnifying glass, which I recommend, um, it has some little ridges along the edges. It looks almost like a pearlescent um, Easter egg, mm -hmm. but a teeny tiny one. It's teeny tiny. And then we also found eggs on this little <laughs> bitty. This, this is just barely out of the ground. You can see this milkweed right here is barely out of the ground, and it also has eggs on it. So this is what they're going to look like when they start to emerge. Like this little branch right here. Just uh -huh. a couple of little leaves is what you're going to see. Where's the egg on that? Oh, good question. <laughs> you're going to make me find it again. Oh. Oh, right here. Oh. Right there on the tip. Right there. Sometimes when you come yeah, at them yeah. from a different angle... Uh -huh. It's harder to find them again. So that's why we uh, put an additional flag here so that we can find these plants that we know have eggs. So interesting. And then in another week or so when we come back, there'll be a little teeny 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 caterpillar. <clears throat> oh, we get so excited when we see a caterpillar. We do. This is the fun time of year when you get to find things. In June and July, when you come out here and it's just hot, and you're asking, why am I out here? There's nothing here. The milkweeds are all dying. Why am I coming out here? Because that's data. That's oh, I, information. I always, I always enjoy coming out here. Even, even in the dry periods when everything's uh, dormant, it's just, it's fun. Well, and there are wildflowers at that time. Of Lots of wildflowers out here. Lots of wildflowers. In another month or so, this place will just be a colorful quilt of wildflowers. Well, Kathy and Gracie, thank you so much it's been fun. for sharing your expertise. And I hope we get a lot of new volunteers this year. Yes, remember the training, May 22nd, if you want. GWagoner at flowapps.com. Okay, and the training session will equip everyone, especially the new students who want to come out, and make new crazy butterfly people friends. Yes, we are we crazy. We have lots of fun. We are crazy butterfly people. Yeah. We have a wonderful time doing all of this. We do have a wonderful time. Well, I want to thank you both for doing this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.